Hey there, my name is Pastor Jim Reinen, and I'm one of the pastors here at Mount of Olives Church in Mission Viejo, California. And once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to today's online church service. Well, it's hard to believe that Christmas has come and gone, but we certainly hope that you and your family had a very Merry Christmas celebrating the birth of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Well, as we begin to move forward into the new year, we certainly want to encourage you to look for ways to get connected. And so we encourage you to go to our church website where you can find our online communication card. By filling out this communication card, we ask you to simply not only register your attendance with us, but let us know who you are. Let us know how you're doing. And let us know how we can be praying for you. Also through the church website, we ask that you look at some of the information related to the various ministries and Bible studies. There's a place to get connected for everybody. And one of those places includes our small group ministry. We have small groups that are being started up every single week. And you don't just need to live in the area to be part of a small group. We've got online small groups that meet together every single week. And those groups include people from out of town who live in different states, even in different countries. So we encourage you to get connected to Mount of Olives Church. Well, as the new year is upon us, something we often talk about this time of the year is something that we call the big promise. And the big promise is simply this. If you're willing to do four things, if you're willing to commit to four different things this year that we guarantee you, yes, I said guarantee. We guarantee you that your life will be better one year from today if you choose to do these four things. And who wouldn't want a better life? Certainly 2020 was filled with a lot of challenges. And so as we move into 2021, here's the list of four things we're encouraging you to do through the big promise. Number one, accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And if you've never done that, if you've never thought about what it means to commit your life to Jesus, please contact us here at the church office, and we'd love to talk with you and lead you through that process. And so the first thing is to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The second thing that we promise will make your life better is that you need to attend church on a regular basis. So what do we mean by attending church on a regular basis? Well, to put it simply, it means that you're at church more than you're not. In other words, on the weekends, we encourage you to make time to attend a church service, whether it's an online service or whether it's attending service in person. But we encourage you to try to go to church three to four times a month three out of the four weekends each month. Attend church regularly. The third area that's part of our big promise is to join a small group. I mentioned it earlier, but again, we believe that if you join a small group, that if you spend time with like-minded believers, that if you join up with this Christian community as part of a small group, that one year from now, your life will be better. And what's the fourth thing? The fourth thing is simply this, that you find a place to serve, to serve within our local church, to look for a place where you can serve at a church. And if you don't live in the Mission Viejo area, we encourage you to find a church in your area where you too can learn to serve, where you can learn to give and be part of a community of service. And so these are the four things. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Attend church regularly. Join a small group. And serve within the ministry of Mount of Olives Church. And we guarantee that if you do these four things, then we promise you, 
your life will be better one year from today. And of course, as we move into 2021 and we make our New Year resolutions, I want to encourage you to consider these four steps that are part of the big promise. And now, let us worship together as we join together for today's online service. May God bless you. Thanks for being with us.
Let us join together as we confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, it's the first Sunday after Christmas, and that means it's time for a song of celebration. It's time to ring the bells. I love this next song for its joyful energy and its bold proclamations. And I don't want you to get thrown because there's some lyrics in the middle that are Sudanese, and they say, Fura hakwa ulimwengo buana amekuja, which means joy to the world, the Lord has come. And by using the these African lyrics, it kind of expresses how this is a worldwide celebration and that even increases the energy because we know that it's not just confined to the United States, but p people across the globe are proclaiming the Lord has come.
Let's join together in the prayer of the day. Heavenly Father, we continue to celebrate your coming to us in the flesh through Jesus Christ. Now that our period of Advent anticipating is over, grant us strength and wisdom as we move forward into a new year. May it be a year of productivity, growing more mature in your grace and love. In Jesus' name, amen. When uh, Pastor Jim asked me a couple of weeks ago what I was going to preach on for my last sermon before my official retirement, it got me to thinking about my very first sermon that I ever preached. It was, I think, 55 years ago, and uh, I preached it at the Union Rescue Mission in the heart of downtown L.A. Uh, My first uh, congregation for a sermon was about uh, 200 homeless men who uh, sat in that auditorium and were uh, restless, uh, kind of mumbling to themselves, coughing now and then. Um, uh, And, uh, you know, every time they coughed, you kind of thought, gosh, I wonder if they're spreading tuberculosis or some other disease. I I guess uh, the the more things uh, change, the more they stay the same, right? but uh, they, they were not a real supportive crowd. Uh, in order to get a hot meal and a cot and clean linens for the night, uh, they had to uh, endure the preaching of a college sophomore, a 19-year-old kid. And I remember my text was from 1 Kings chapter 20. It's the story of uh, old Syrian king Ben-Hadad. And he goes up against uh, Ahab's army, and uh, he uh, is soundly defeated, even though uh, Ben-Hadad has a superior army, uh, far outnumbers the Israelites. He's defeated. And uh, so his counselors come to him, and they comfort him in verse 23 of 1 Kings chapter 20. And it says, the servants of king, uh, uh, the king of Syria said to him, the gods of, uh, of the Israelites, their gods, are the gods of the hills. And so they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. Well, that was his big mistake, to assume that the God of Israel was a God only of the hills and not of the valleys as well. You see, his gods... Uh, were localized gods. They were regional royalties. Uh, There was a god for the lakes and a god for the the streams and a god for the forests and a god for the fields. He had no understanding of Yahweh, the god of the universe, the god of the entire cosmos. And so he lured Israel for a second battle out onto the valley where the plains Uh, would be to his advantage, he felt. But once again, he was soundly defeated by an inferior army because Israel's Yahweh was with them and was faithful. And Ahab, Israel's king, trusted in him. You know, uh, I think sometimes we make the same mistake that uh, King Ben-Hadad made. We assume that that God is uh, just a God of the high points of our lives, but sometimes we feel forsaken in the low spots. There was, uh, for a long time, I don't know if it's still there, but uh, a sign in front of Forest Home Christian Conference Center in the San Bernardino Mountains. And the sign read as you approached on the highway, uh, Forest Home, elevation 5,280 feet, and then it had the slogan, one mile closer to heaven. Well, I know what they had in mind. I, I, I understand they were just trying to say that sometimes when we go to a place and set apart uh, a time to meet God, that, that maybe he becomes more real to us in that setting. But in an unintended way, that slogan can also diminish God. It can cause us to think that he is in some places, but not in others. 
You know, that just is uh, something that I find Christians practice in very subtle ways. I've heard Christians say, you know, my old home church was such a great church. And uh, I just loved that church. And our pastor, he was such a great pastor. You know, I've just never been able to find another church or never been able to find another pastor like that home church or like that pastor. You know, we think we're paying great tribute to God and, and, and to that home church and that pastor. But the truth of the matter is we're diminishing God. We're saying that he was the God of the hills of our past, but he's not the God of the valleys of our present. There's no other pastor that God could speak through because it wouldn't be my old pastor. There's no other church that's going to be just like my old church. And, and so maybe I just won't look. But God is intend, intending for us to understand that if we're looking for him only in certain places and not willing to meet him in the new places in our lives, well, we're just not trying very hard and we're not understanding who he is. You know, a second thing that this story tells me from uh, 1 Kings 20 is that uh, God is not just the the God of Bible heroes and Bible stories. But God is also the God of our stories as well. You know, I used to think, gosh, if I just would have lived in the time of Moses, you know, if, if I could have seen him part the Red Sea, well, it would have been so much easier to believe. Or, or if I could have seen Jesus heal the blind man, uh, well, then, you know, it would be easy to believe in Jesus. They had it so much easier than we did. But I don't think that's really true. If we cannot depend on God to part the seas of our distress or to heal the blind spots of our current day living, well, I'm not sure that living back in the times of Jesus or of Moses would have done it for us easy either. Because after all, you know, the crossing of the Red Sea, well, the Israelites saw all that, but they still worshiped the golden calf many months later. And the Pharisees personally interviewed the man who had been healed by Jesus, who had been blind all his life. But that wasn't enough for them. They weren't ready to believe. You see, every time we open the Bible, we really find that a kind of resurrection occurs. Those old heroes of the Bible come out of the grave and they start to speak to us. We are every character that we read about in the Bible. We are ben Hadad, believing that God is limited. Or we are King Ahab, believing that even though our army is inferior, God will be superior to whatever battle we must win. And so uh, I, I, that's something that I personally tried to say uh, to my 16 grandkids. You may remember a couple of years ago, I, I wrote this book, uh, Marzipan Bananas. And in it, uh, it begins with a, a Bible verse or a Bible story, and then it quickly goes into a story about my life. And I, I wrote one of them for each of the 16 grandkids. And then in the author's notes, I, I said to them, God's stories are our stories. You see, the Bible is not just an old hill, a kind of boot hill of old Bible heroes who are dead and gone. The Bible is a cradle. It's a cradle where when we read their stories, we begin to see new stories birthed in our lives where God is still active. Not just the God of the hills, but God of our valleys in a contemporary way as well. Well, there's one final way that I want to share with you that I believe uh, God is still active in our lives. And that is that uh, this text tells us, I think, that we can assume God is not just the God of our hears, but the God of our hereafters as well. You know, uh, it occurs to me that there are at least four reasons why I can believe that, that God is going to be uh, waiting for us on the other side as we trust in Jesus. The first is that Jesus promised it. He said... Uh, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, uh, you may be also. 
And he goes further and he says, if that wasn't the case, I would have told you so. Out of uh, the 60 books in the Bible, 54 of them have mention of heaven in them. And so I believe that God is not only the God of our hearers, but also the God of our hereafters. I think a second reason is, is that everything I've experienced in this world, whether it be the joy of uh, going on a fly fishing trip with my son and my grandson, uh, whether it be just stepping out into the, into the backyard in the morning and smelling the fresh air in the, uh, in the early uh, seeing maybe a sunrise or a sunset, uh, the colors of a rose garden, uh, the passions of life, the joy of, of loving and being loved. Everything in this life that is good reminds me that there must be something more. How much better is it going to be? You know, when we were birthed into this life, we came from a womb that sustained us, but it wasn't nearly as brilliant and colorful and wonderful and filled with potential as this life is. But what about when we are birthed into the next? How great is that going to be? There's a third reason. I think that it's just natural for human beings to want to believe that God is going to meet us in the hereafter. The great Russian Christian novelist Fedor Dostoevsky, he wrote, surely I have not suffered simply that I may manure the soil of the future for someone else. You see, what he believed was that if we have a hunger for heaven, well, that in itself is an evidence that heaven exists. After all, if, if we have a hunger for food, well, food must exist. If we have a hunger for, for air, well, air must exist. If we have a hunger for sunlight and warmth, well, sunlight and warmth must exist. And if in the heart of every human being there is a hunger to reach out to the Almighty God, then I believe He exists, not just in the hills of our todays, but in the valleys of our forever afters as well. If Jesus knew the presence of God, even at Golgotha, the hill of the skull in Aramaic, if he could say, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then on Easter morning, if God could roll away the stone from Jesus' tomb in the valley, the valley and the, the depths, the very valley of the shadow of death, well, then I believe that God can be in our hills and in our valleys as well. Story after story gives evidence of that. I remember hearing the story of little Matthew Huffman. He was the child of missionaries in uh, uh, Brazil. And on one day, he began to, to feel badly and have a high temperature. And uh, he complained to his mother, and she noticed that his temperature was just beginning to soar. And they quickly put him into their car and began to drive to the nearest hospital. And as they made their way to the, the hospital, uh, little Matthew, only six years old, he began to lift his hand up. And his, his mother uh, just grabbed his hand and, and held it and pulled it to her bosom. And, and, and little Matthew shook her hand away, and he reached again upward. And she just thought that the poor child is delirious. She grabbed his hand and she pulled it to her again. And he shook it away again. And then he reached again toward the, the, the roof of the car again as she, he lay in her lap. And she said to him tenderly, Matthew, what are you reaching for? And his response is a sentence that his parents have never, ever forgotten. Little Matthew said, I'm reaching, Mommy, for the hand of Jesus. You see, whatever else little Matthew in his six years had not learned, he had learned the most important thing, that God is not just the God of our hears, but he is the God of our hereafters who will take hold of our hand 
and see us into his presence. With that sentence, little Matthew went into a coma, and within two days, he had joined the Lord in heaven. He had died of spinal meningitis, but what he had taught his parents was a great faith in a God who is not only the God of our hills, but the God of our valleys, the God of our here and now, and the God of our forever afters. And when that time comes, my friend, when you reach out, no matter what your age, no matter what your circumstance, when that time comes, the very gospel that I preached 55 years ago at the Union Res Rescue Mission is the same gospel, the same truth that applies to us this morning. When that day comes, when we reach out for God, we will feel the clasp of a familiar hand and we will hear our name called and we will know the one who calls our name. He will be Jesus, the God of our hills and our valleys. Jesus, the author not just of the Bible stories and the heroes therein, but the author of the stories of our lives, the texts written in our experiences. And he will be not just the God of our here and now, but the God of our forever afters. Praise be to God. Pray with me. Gracious God, thank you that you cannot be limited, that you do not just hold reign over the good times, over the easy times, over the fun times. But Lord, that you are there in the crucifixions of our lives. You are there, Lord, for us in the midst of divorce, in the midst of job loss, in the midst of not knowing if we will find a cure this side of heaven, in the midst of great loss and grief. We thank you, dear Lord, that you are and always have been the God of our hills and the God of our valleys. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.
the days are hasting on by prophets seen of old when with the ever circling years shall come the time foretold when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling and the whole world sent back the song which now the angels sing